Adobe reporting a first quarter earnings beak. Take a look at the stock up nearly 3% at all time highs. The company's subscription revenue grew nearly 30% this quarter alone. Shantanu Narayan is the CEO of Adobe, joins us here at Post 9. Shantanu, great to have you here in New York. Thanks for having me here. Great to be here. You guys uh, just have really been rolling a juggernaut in terms of a stock up nearly 3x in three years. It used to be that skittishness around any particular area of marketing could hit your stock, but you've broadened and now with this subscription uh, model, it's a bit deeper. Short of a full-blown recession, what kinds of events could sidetrack uh, the business? When you think of the two businesses we're in, John, and empowering people to create and helping businesses transform, we just think that digital is going to be a fundamental tailwind for both businesses. And the fact is that there are very few companies on the planet who actually serve everybody from individual freelancers who have a story to tell all the way to large enterprises who are trying to transform themselves. So, you know, the economy is clearly doing well across the board, uh, but we also look at it and say, should things change, it's strong companies that get stronger. Hmm. You, know, you guys did a, an upward revision in your guidance based on the new tax law. You haven't been shy historically in M&A, but I was looking. Since 2009, you haven't gone two years without buying something worth hundreds of millions of dollars. It's been about 18 months since Tube Mogul. Are you shopping, and what areas are you looking at? It is, is it artificial intelligence now? We're constantly looking for great companies and you know our criteria tends to be more technology because we're a product company at heart. Um, Tube Mogul was an incredibly successful acquisition. It enabled us to have a one-stop shop uh, for anybody who wanted to spend money digitally across linear TV as well as search, social and display. Um, with respect to AI itself, we're doing a lot of our own organic investment in AI. It's hard to get uh, great resources, but Adobe Sensei uh, is actually starting starting to do more magic on both the digital media as well as on the digital marketing side. But it tends to be fewer companies in AI. They may be aqua hires more so than companies because our focus in AI is our domains. It's documents, it's video, it's marketing. How should investors look at how AI ends up influencing your business, particularly now that you're on this subscription track? Does it uh, increase retention? Does it increase the amount that people are willing to spend for certain types of features? I think it helps on both retention as well as an acquisition. Uh, when you think about acquisition, people are intimidated. They have the story that they want to tell, they want to use Adobe products, and AI is going to be dramatically simplifying the ability, whether it's through voice, whether it's through touch, whether it's through gestures, to create content, whether it's for augmented reality, virtual reality. So AI, I think, will make our products and all the power of our products dramatically easier to use. On the marketing side, you know, we process over 150 trillion transactions. And as a marketer, you have a campaign idea and you want to execute it. The only way to execute it is for the software to actually move from data collection to automation and insight. And I think that's where AI will start to really understand at that margin is that last dollar better spent on search or social or display. And that's where we are putting our AI to work. You mentioned macro factors in the economy doing well. Um, is, do you tie the company's performance to something as broad as employment? Or is it more about individual marketing budgets or the migration of budgets to digital or something else? I think it's both businesses, Carl. So when we look at uh, you know what's happening with uh, businesses and the enterprise, it's certainly tied to the macro factor of how businesses are doing and what's happening with employment. I think on the individual side and on the creative side, we just believe that every K through 12 student as well, there should be a new way for them uh, to create content. And when you think about how education needs to get transformed, there's a very significant part of our business that's associated with you know, ensuring that people can do content creation. And last but not least, we said this in the quarter, Acrobat and PDF, had an absolutely phenomenal quarter. And so people are still automating inefficient paper-based processes. PDF has won as the de facto format for PD, uh, what's happening with documents. And so I think, you know, whether it's PDF or signatures, which enables people on the cost-cutting side uh, to enable their processes to go digital. So I, I think, you know, it's the breadth of our portfolio and the innovation that's actually leading to the success. Well, give, give me some sense then, Shantanu, and how large the market for creative content 
Washington could become. I know over the last five years it's grown enormously. It's obviously been one of the reasons why your company has done so incredibly well. But over the next 10 years, what are we talking about? Well, we've said that, you know, if you look at our creative business, we just passed uh, 5 billion in ARR for the first time, which is a, a record. Uh, when you think, look at addressable markets. We've said that the total addressable market for all of Adobe is well north of $80 billion, $20 billion plus on the creative side, 60 on the digital uh, marketing and on the enterprise side, and at $8.7 billion in revenue, which was the annual targets that we issued. I think there's still significant headroom across both of these. Then you think about new media types that are emerging, right. augmented reality, virtual reality, what's happening with character animation, and the ability in real time to uh, do things like that. It's so early in the space that, you know, it's exploding growth, but we feel like there's significant headroom. I want to ask you about policy. Typically, we think of companies like Adobe not being affected as much by protectionist policies, perhaps in the U.S. and other places. But you do hear about cloud providers being affected because their capital costs go up. They've got to perhaps build out more data centers in more places because of these different uh, regulations. Is that how we should think about uh, protectionism potentially affecting Adobe? Is it going to increase your costs? Well, John, we think of two things. Uh, the first is clearly there's far more focus on data privacy and what data is stored on our servers in which country with GDPR coming up, you know, how do we think about that as well as security of these servers. And, you know, that's an important obligation and responsibility that we take very seriously. And so we clearly have server farms right now all across the world. We've also done that in conjunction in our partnership with Microsoft where we're leveraging Azure. So I, I tend to think of it a little bit less as protectionism and a little more as are we anticipating what customer needs are going to be in these countries. But and this we, tariff buzz, do you look at that as a potential increase of your costs? If, well, if we end up with a sort of tit for tat, you know, other countries looking at ways to harm the U.S.? Well, I'm an optimist and I continue to think that, you know, uh, we will find a way to make sure that we can actually have uh, free trade. Uh, but as it relates to us, you're right. It's server costs and ensuring that the servers are in each of the locations where our uh, offerings are. That is going to be the important issue. Uh, we, we always tend to look forward here, but I think it is just for a moment to, to look back. You added $100 billion in market value over the last eight years. You went through an enormous transition that has worked. Was there a point at which you finally knew it was going to work? And when was that? We always knew up front that we could deliver a better product by moving to the cloud. Instead of traditional 12 or 18 month product cycles <laughs> where we told every one of our engineers, don't talk about what you're working on because heaven forbid existing customers may not buy it. Uh, so we always knew we could build a meta mousetrap. We ran an experiment in Australia that was incredibly successful. I, but I'd be, uh, you know, uh, not completely truthful if I said we knew exactly how this would play out. We just said our job is to deliver better products, more innovation for our customers. And if we had to take a short-term hit, the entire management team was completely behind doing it. And it's worked out well. Yeah, Shantanu, that, uh, you and I go way back. That Omnitra buy and the move into digital mar marketing looked nuts to a lot of people in Silicon Valley at the time. They thought, well, this isn't Adobe. But you've tied it together. Data is the story. I guess the stock speaks for itself. Thanks for being with us here in Squawk Alley. Thank you all for having me. Shantanu Narayan. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.